Good evening, Shalom Aleichem. Let's go straight to beginning our shir. This is a Thursday evening of Parshas Kedoshim. So someone asked me a question, not really a halacha question, but asking that we are familiar the idea of Yerushalayim loy nishal kol eshvotim. Yerushalayim was not distributed to uh, to the various tribes, and the difference, the halacha would be that when uh, the Oile Rega, when the pilgrims would come to Yerushalayim for Yom Tov, they wouldn't have to pay rent for their uh, accommodation because it was, uh, it, it belonged to all the tribes. And therefore, okay, so you have your Israel Loinus Shvotim. There's also a well known concept that the Mizbeach had a corner missing and that is because the Mizbeach had to be in the territory of Benyamin was compared to a wolf and the Mizbeach is compared to a wolf and that particular corner was in the territory of Yehuda and hence the question was Yushalayim Nishal Kol Shavatim or not that's the question so the simple answer is that actually that this is a machlokus of Tanoim. It's a, there's two opinions. Now here you have the Gemara in Yuma, Dafyud Base, says that the one who says um, the this whole business about a strip going out from the land of Yehuda and jutting into the territory of Binyamin, and that's where there was this uh, problem with the building of the Mizbeach, and that's why there was a corner missing. That's all according to the opinion who holds that Yushalayim is Chalkol is Shvatim. But if you hold that Yishalayim was Loinus Chalkol Shvatim, then this explanation doesn't really hold. Before, um, okay, so what then if Yishalayim was Loinus Chalkol Shvatim? So Toysus asked the question, Toysus in Zvachim. So why it looks, seems to be that the missing corner of the Mizbeach was uh, un unanimously accepted, although there was a machlokas on his chakal So if that wasn't the reason why the corner of the Mizbeach was missing, why then was it missing? So I don't know whether I've shared it once before. There's a fascinating shot in the Zohar, which says that the four sides of the Mizbeach correspond to the four machanoits, the four groups of the Yidden as they traveled in the desert. And you had Degel Machne Ephraim and Degel Machne Don, and then you had to the east, you had Degel Machne Yehuda, and to the south, you had Degel Machne Ruuvein. The Yesoid of the Mizbeach corresponds to Yosef HaTzadik. Often hear the Lashon Yosef, Yosef is Lashon of Apostle. The of the twelve tribes, the uh, camp of Ephraim and Asher Binyamin, and the camp of Don Naftali Osher were totally innocent of any harassment of Yosef. Therefore, the Yosoid on their side remains intact. On the south side, which is the Reuven, Shimon, and God. And on the east side, which is Yehuda, Yisoch, and Zvulun, because they, some of them at least, most of them, did harass Yosef. Therefore, the Mizbeah, the Yosoid of the Mizbeah, which corresponds to Yosef, is incomplete. The Mishnah in Midas says, V'oichel b'dorim amo achas, b'mizrach amo achas. Although the Mizbeah, the Yosoid, was incomplete, but on the south there was one armor which was there, and there was one armor on the east, which was there, says the Zoyar, because Yehuda and because Reuven did intercede to do what they could to help Yosef. Therefore, there is at least a symbolic presence on the, a little bit on the Dorim and a little bit on the, on the Mizrach corresponding to uh, Reuven's and, uh, and, and Yehuda's intervention to for the uh, welfare of Yosef. Coming back to this basic, uh, this question of Nishalkal Shvatim, etc. So what I did find in this Mephorosh on Yosef Bechor was one of 
Bali Atosos, I believe. My impression of what he's suggesting is that before Yerushalayim, before the era of David HaMelech, Yerushalayim was a, a territory like any other anywhere else in Eretz Yisrael, which was distributed to the Shvatim. Once Yerushalayim was chosen to be the residence of the Shechina or the Besamikdash, then things changed. Then Yerushalayim had to be taken away from the individual Shvatim. It had to be given to all the Shvatim. Uh, the ones who were deprived of that territory were given the land of the city Yericho. Yericho had been desolate all those years from when Yeshua entered the, the land, where they, the walls of Yericho came tumbling down, etc. So it had remained desolate all this time. And then it was given to the uh, ownership of Yerushalayim. They were given instead, they were given the ownership of Yericho. Uh, so what he's suggesting is that we could reconcile the two views and say, that there was a historic uh, territory of, of Yehuda and Binyamin, although that was no longer applicable in the, um, in the legal sense once the Beis Mikdash was built. But as you see, the Gemara clearly uh, says that it actually is this um, business of Yehuda's land jutting into Yosef's goes according to the opinion that that Niskalka Yerushalayim is bottom. Just one before we go further. This idea of Yerushalayim being not the territory of a particular Shevet, but of all the Shvatim, reminds me of where uh, in many countries, the capital is not a particular state, like Washington, D.C., is not part of the state of Maryland, etc. There is an idea, because it's the capital city, therefore it shouldn't belong to a particular Shevet, which be as if to dominate over, over others. So on a, a very simple level, that could have been also the Chesbid, why Yishalayim, Leinus Chal Kodeshvatim, it actually belongs to everyone. Let's move on. So someone, okay, um, this, is, should, this, is number, this is number three. Um, Switch around the order. Three and switch around. Okay, so here's the question about when you're putting on tefillin. Do you, between the shilyad and the shalrosh, do you interrupt to answer kedusha, borchu, etc.? Now, the top quote here is from the newly printed Kitzah Shuchan Aruch, which um, was written by Rav Shlom Gansfried about 100 and something, 90 years ago, perhaps a bit more, 200 years ago. About 30 years ago, Rav Levi Bitstritsky, Oliver Sholem, worked on incorporating, interspersing the Psokim of the Alter Rebbe, the decision of Alter Rebbe, into the text of the Kitzvah Shechanar. About 10 years ago, Kahos publication of New York uh, asked me to work on collating the Minhoge Chabad. And so that I did at the time, and Baruch Hashem, as I've told you before, that was published about three months ago. And those come at the bottom of the page. But meanwhile, I had a certain degree of responsibility for what's going on in the main text. And here there was, a, unfortunately, a mistake crept in, which this one never brought to my attention. So I want to share with you what this mistake is. So it is in the Kitsu Shivanaru, it's Simon Yud in Hichas Tefillin. And the, let's read what the Kitsu writes. If you hear Kaddish Kedusha or um, yeah, between Shalyad and Shalrosh, don't interrupt to answer, just listen what the people are saying, but don't interrupt. So then in the, uh, his interspersed from that the Alter Rebbe indeed says the same in the Shechan Aruch, whereas in the Siddur he says that between the Shayad and Shalrosh you are allowed to interrupt to answer Kaddish Kedusha Ubarchu and Omen Al Kol Habrachis. Once you've interrupted, you then have to say Al Mitzvah Tefillin before putting on or tightening the Shalrosh. This, these three, four words, the Omen Al Kol Habrachis, are incorrect because. The heter between Shilyad and Sharosh, which the Al-Tarebbe says in Rashi's, 
is only for Dova Shebek Dusha, for Kadach Dusha and Borchu. The heter to say Amen al Kol Habrochas, which the Alter Rebbe says, is in Rabbeinu Tams. So here, what you have, um, the second or third paragraphs, are from the Alter Rebbe's Siddha. And the Alter Rebbe is saying, you shouldn't be mafsik, you shouldn't interrupt with Shad and Shalrosh. Um, but if you did hear Kedusha, etc., you should re answer. Ah, you're causing a bracha that you have to make another bracha, and you're not one's not allowed to cause an unnecessary bracha. The answer is there are the Minigashkadas who always say a second bracha on the Shalrosh, even without having interrupted. All right, so we're Machmir because Suffolk Brachas is the Hokil. We don't say a second bracha on the Shalrosh on a daily basis. But here, which the question is, do you forfeit saying Kedusha? So here, because of you want to say Kedusha, that's a value to say Kedusha or, or Kadosh Borchu, so that overrides the kind of the uh, iffiness, if that's the right word, about Brach Hashem Tzricha. And so he says, for, okay, normally we don't say Al Mitzvah Tfilin, but in order to be able to say Dova uh, Shebe Kedusha, to respond to Dova Kedusha, we will say Al Mitzvah Tfilin. That's the Alter Rebbe's Psak as far as Rashi's Tfilin goes. Later on, he refers to Shifrin of Rabbi Nutam. He starts off, he says, you may, if you find it uncomfortable to put it in on in shul, you can put it at, at, at home. And uh, on, although I know that Minna Chabad is generally to put them one after the other, Shal Rabbi Nutam is as, as soon as possible after Shalru, after Shal um, Rashi's. But okay. But then he says, even though you're not making another any bracha, neither on the Shalyad or the Shalrosh, you, should, you still should not interrupt between Shilyaz and Shilrosh. And that's got a basis in the Baal Hamor, where he says that, that there's idea that the Shilyaz and Shilrosh are, in a sense, like one mitzvah. And therefore, even when there's no question of an extra bracha, you still don't interrupt between Shilyaz and Shilrosh. However, he says, between Shilyaz and Shilrosh of Rabbeinu Tams, you can answer Amen. And certainly you can answer Kedusha Baruch Hu and Amen. Similarly, a person put a gun to fill Chalamoid, which we don't, but fine. So the same thing, you're not saying, you're not saying a bracha I, on, on, on either to fill in. Therefore, don't interrupt, but in order to answer Amen, and certainly Dovashim Kedusha, you can answer. So what would happen over here, I don't know how this mistake got in, but the, uh, the, uh, the way it's written in the Kitzer is incorrect. Um, the omen al kol would have to go afterwards. You should say like this: after uh, having interrupted for kadosh kedusha baruch you can uh, then say shall, on the shalrosh you'll say amitzvah tefillin, or but tefillin the rabbeinu tam you can answer omen al kol That's how it should have been written. So unfortunately, this is a bit, a bit of a, uh, you know, I, I'm perhaps I mentioned this before. This poskim say when you publish a sefer uh, about not saying shechianu, so a big it's a big simcha. But on the other hand, you're going to um, discover a lot of mistakes so there's not such a simcha yeah once it's been published with a mistake there's a reason for okay now having I, I want to share with you something a bit more intriguing about this whole story um here on the top quote is a letter from the Friedrich Rebbe to the Isaac Baruch the Isaac Baruch was a mashpia I'm not sure whether it was at Vodsko in Varsha he was a mashpia in the yeshiva in Poland and um, I believe he was killed by the Nazis, Yimachshma. This letter is dated Menachem of Tovshin, 19. It's in the uh, summer of 1940. And the letter says, since you were saying Shema Yisrael, you shouldn't interrupt. Even though Alpidin, you can interrupt between Shalyad and Sharosh. As to answer Omin of Kadish or Badu Kurusha to answer to, to and then you'd have to make a brook on the Shalros. However, it's better to be Medaic not to interrupt between Shalyad and Shalros, not to make extra brachas. And the Abisha should give you Hatzloch in your Avoida and you should be healthy, etc. So in the footnote of the editor, they suggest that possibly this is oh, this is a right a, a messaging code. We don't know, we don't understand what the code is, 
But this whole business of interrupting between one and the other could very well have been a coded message to, because at, at the time the yeshiva was running away from Warsaw, they fled to Vilna, um, Baruch Hashem, many of them made their way to Shanghai, etc., and came uh, safely to America. Unfortunately, many didn't. Um, but possibly this was a coded message. Because it's what is interesting here, he's saying you sh one should avoid answering between Shalyad and Shalrosh, but perhaps he didn't mean that literally. The second quote which we have here is a letter of the Rebbe, our Rebbe, to Rebbe Vrom Hersh Koyen. This is in the round, um, I think it's Tovshin Yud Zayin. Rebbe Vrom Hersh Koyen was a tremendous Tamil Chochem. Actually, he was a, a, a close friend of the late, late Rav Padve, Allah Shalom, um, similar age. And uh, he became this character to Chabad, he became a, a, a Fabrent a very, very uh, passionate Chosid of the Rebbe. But he was, a, in addition to that, he was a tremendous Tamil Chochem. And it looks like he had asked the Rebbe this very question. Should one, if you're middle of putting on tefillin, should you answer um, Amish Rabbe, etc.? And the Alto Rebbe, sorry, the Rebbe answers, Mi l'shein admur hazokin, sheloi levatl chulu, mukach de chiyavu. The fact that the Alto Rebbe uses those words, one should, sheloi levatl, you should not miss out. You're allowed to answer, um, between the Shiyad Sharosh and cause an extra bracha not to miss out Dova Shabikdusha. So the Rebbe is reading into that, it's not optional, but that is actually the advised thing to do. But you should interrupt between Shiyad and Sharosh and say another bracha on the Tefillin and Sharosh. Um, there's also some writings of the late Rav Greenglass, Sholem, who also has had said there's something about not interrupting, and possibly he's because of this letter of the Frederick Rebbe, but Lamai said the Rebbe takes it literally that the Alter Rebbe says you are let you, that you he's saying that you should, if you're in the middle of putting it on tefillin and, and you hear Amish Mirabah between Shayyad and Shadrosh, you should answer and you'll say another bracha. Um, so on that odd occasion, you'll behave like a Ashkenazim. Um, and in the future, you'll make sure to put on the film in good time. You wouldn't have it, you won't have this conflict. Okay, let's move on. Right, uh, no, let's go back. Yes, so someone asked me, they were, unfortunately, they were Leviya, um, actually it was Rosh Chodesh, and they, he went to the, to the cemetery, and he has a relative, some relatives buried in the same cemetery. What, is there any objection after the Leviya to go over to the grave of your relative and to say some tilim there, etc. You're already there. You know, there's a certain logic. You're already, you're already there. You should ignore that you have it. But actually, uh, so I, I wasn't aware about the, of this, but then I, I did my homework and I came I, I came across actually through Rabbi Garelik's um, Madrich. So he gave it, he brought me to this source. This is from the Munkacherov, the Minchas Elazar. He's got a safer, uh, it came out in booklets called Divrei Taira. And he says the following. It says in the Zohar, when a body, a deceased, is brought to the grave, all the, all the mesim, all the other dead, they all get upset. They all get angry almost, vexed. And they say, Vai, vai, the door is come. Whoa, whoa, this person is also coming into the grave. This is the Lashon of the Zoya that the, the other um, Mesim are, are upset when a Leviah happens. So, this, he says, is a clear basis for what I heard from my, my grandfather and going back from. His, his, his uh, predecessors and the family of the Dino family, which is the Medei Soscha, that they have a tradition that one should not go to the Tzion of a Tzadik at the time when there is a, uh, a Leviah burial in the Sebe Sachayim, because at that time, the Mesim are upset and that arouses Dinim, Rachman Litzlan, and therefore, it's not a time of rachmim and rotsim. And according to, so 
they were, this is, and, and therefore, according to the Zoyar, it's clear that when there is a, a, a body being brought for burial, so then the uh, the Mesim are saying, vai, vai, wo, wo. And we, when we go to pray by Kibir Tzadikim, it's, we're looking for to relate into an ace rot an auspicious time, Hashem Yishmerenu Yechayenu. So we're seeing here there is a reason for uh, apprehension um, of going to a caver to ask for to, to pray for them to pray for you um, when when it's not an ace rot. Now in Rabbi Gorelik's Sefer, it, it seems to be that the Rebbe would go into the Frederick Rebbe's uh, seeing, even, uh, but it's not such a clear thing. And again, what's happening with the Rebbe's is a different story. But we, meanwhile, what we do see, there is a marker for this minig of not going to uh, uh, visiting Kavarium at the time when there's Levi going on. Okay. Interesting. It seems to be even uh, random, even that's nothing connected with you. Yeah, at the same time, there's a Levi going on, you shouldn't be davening at another caver, which is quite an interesting chiddush. Okay, um, we go on. So, we have something very interesting about the Haftorah of these two weeks. When, when we have two Haftorahs, which come, sorry, when we've got two Sedras together, so then the default position is that the Haftorah is of the second one. It is A and B. So the, the Haftorah of B is the one which is read. This is the Ramur. You can see the upper quote is in the Ramur in Simutov Kovches. With the exception, he says, of Acharemus and Kedoshim, that when they come together, we read the Haftorah Haraloi Kivne Kushim, which is the Haftorah of Achre. So here you can see on the, 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 the Haftorah, although this is again, you see there's a note of debate about that, but the Haftorah of Achre is Haloi Kivne Kushim. Haftorah of Kedoshim, well, you've got a variation between Ashkenaz and Sfard in Italian. You've got Hasishpoit, Hasishpoit in Yecheskel, or we have the other one, Halidrosh Oishiyatem Boim. And meanwhile, what we're seeing is that when Achre and Kedoshim are combined, so untypically, it's the Haftorah of the first one which is followed. What's the reason for that? So, the answer seems to be, well, the background for this is that between the two passages, this one in Amos and this one in Yechezkel, the one in Yechezkel is quite a harsh passage. And therefore, if you have to choose between the two, so better choose the, the, the milder, the more pleasant one, as in more, more positive, etc. And therefore, that's the Minhig. We are going back hundreds and hundreds of years, going back to Zaman or Rishonim at least, for, that you'd read the Haftorah of Halokiv Nikashim in preference over the one of Kadosh. Now, when Rabbi Kiva Eger comes up with a very interesting observation, he says, This, this year, Tof Shin Pei Base, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. We, on Parashas Achare, we did not read the Haftorah, Allah Havalei Koshim, because it was Mocha Chodesh, because, it, because um, Sunday was Rosh Chodesh. So, Haloi Chivnei Koshim wasn't read in public. So then, we should take Haloi Chivnei Koshim and use it for Parashas Kedoshim. For this Shabbat, you should be reading the Haftorah of Haloi Chivnei Koshim. Since there is a certain degree of interchangeability, and you didn't use Alok of Nekoshim last week, so therefore you should use it this week. Having said that, the uh, and Rebbe Eger is quoted in the Mishnah Brura La Halocha, so you, there will be communities which this week will say after us it will be read Halok um, of Nekoshim. Uh, in the Luach Koilo Chabad, it does not follow that. And it says to follow the Haftorah of Kedoshim, not the Haftorah of Achrei. 
By the way, this is going to open, happen in Chutzlars, apparently. I didn't go through the whole thing. Also, I have a, a note somehow that in Tov Shin Lamad Ches, which was the same calendar Kavias as this year, also that the Rebbe read the Haftar of, of Halidrosh rather than, in other words, the Haftar of, of, uh, of, of the Sfardim, of, 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 of Kadoshim rather than the Haftar of of uh, Achremus. So the point, although Rabbi Kiva has this opinion, we don't follow that in this instance, and we follow that this week we're going to do the Haftarah of Pasha's Kedoshim. What may be impacting this uh, uh, decision is possibly that the, for, for Kedoshim itself, there's two variations, whether you read the one Hasishpoit or Halidrosh. Possibly there were one halidros, which we is our, I mean, in any case, possibly is a milder one in any case. And therefore, the need to start mixing around is not, is, is, is not you know, not felt necessary. At any rate, that just to confirm, I had this call this week and I, and I had done the research in the past and I was able to share that our minig is indeed to say the Haftorah of Pasha Skadoshim. I'm going to the chat for a moment. Someone is saying, when one visits the Bisoilum on a yard set of a relative. Yes, that's what I find very interesting. That according to the, um, the Mincha Salazar, according to that quote, he seems to be saying that um, if, well, why are you going to the, to the relative? If you're going there to Davin, that they should Davin for you, well, it's not an Ace Rodson. If you're going there just out of respect, then I don't think that's a problem. One visits Miss Olam on a yurt side relative. Come and go and visit other relatives buried there. Yes, when you're visiting on a yurt side, there's no there's no problem to go to other relatives. I don't see any problem with that. It's only when there's a levaya going on. So then he's got this lotion of the zoya that there's the and they may seem are vexed. Then it's not an esrotsim. But when you're there, you go to others. Yeah, I mean, you have the, the famous idea which um, with Yaakov Avinu is you've come to the. You know, nearby, and you didn't go in to say hello, so to speak. So, yeah, that, that was my logic originally. Right. Now, um, something was brought to my attention, a, a interesting, a, a diary. A, we know we, we, we're all familiar with the Luach Kol Chabad, which is uh, on a chart in the shul. And the earliest I knew of it, the earliest edition was published by Reb Chaim Noe in the 30s. But recently someone brought to my attention that there is such a Luach Beis HaKnesses, Lafi Minog Chabad, from Tofresh Samach Vov, which is about, help me, about 115 years ago. Yeah. So I went, I, and, and someone took that diary, and, and, and uh, that, sorry, Luach, and kind of deciphered it, and worked on it and I found it fascinating and I've spent um, a couple of weeks going through it and seeing, it's fascinating to see how many differences there are in Minha Chabad in comparison to what uh, was the uh, written in that Luach. Just one for one example, um, Arba Parashios, over Achmim, yes or no? So there it says, you don't say, as it's written, how it says in the Ramor, the Dalit Parashios, you know, um, Shikolim and all that, you don't say, um, uh, you don't say over Achmim, Min Chabad is Parshas Poro, and that's the same thing as the Chosnin Shul. We do say Avar uh, the, the The posh, the reason, in my understanding, is that in the Velt, on the Arab Parshas, they say Yoitzras. They say Yoitzras, so then it becomes a whole celebration. And therefore, you don't say Avar But in Chabad, we don't say Yoitzras, so therefore, Arab Parshas, you don't have to, so therefore, you have to make a whole, uh, um, it doesn't, it's not such a big celebration. That's why I'm not in a very simplistic way. But meanwhile, I saw a very interesting thing. This is, he refers to in that Luach, um, he says a Minig, and the one who, who uh, deciphered it, etc., gave this reference. There's a Sefer Keser Kahuna, written by a, 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 someone called Rev. Doiv Rifman, or Beryl Rifman. He also wrote a Sefer called Shulchan HaKriya, on Kriya Satoire. And there is a, Two, three page letter of the Rebbe Rasham, very strong letter about the importance of listening to Kriya Satoira uh, attentively. And it's published at the back of the Siddur Torah, it's published at the back of the Siddurim Dach. Um, I'm sure it's published other places also. And there he mentions the Sefer Shulchan HaKriya. 
And so it's the same Mechaber. Meanwhile, he says the following. He's talking, we, everyone knows the Gemara, there's that the Koyun has to be Oike Raglov Ba'avoido. That if a Koyun uh, wants to uh, participate in Bichas Koyanim, he has to start moving towards, towards, towards what? Towards washing his hands? Towards the, uh, towards the uh, front of the Mishul? Um, okay, he has to start moving by Ritzay. If he didn't move by Ritzay and only during Moedim, he realized, oops, um, it's Bechas Koyun today, it's too late. He can't, he can't join. He has to have started his move by Bavoida. So now he says the following. The Yesh Mikoimus Shinoyagim Hakoyanim La Koira Galehem Little Esyodeem. The Koyanim start moving to wash their hands when the Chazan says, Bahoshev Koyanim La Vedosum Ulavium Lashiro Melazimro. That's the, the last piece of the, of, of the Shwain Esra before it say, um, and there it has restored the Koyanim to the Avoid and the Levim. To their singing and etc., and that would be the cue when the koyanim would move from their places, go over to wherever the wash basin is, and wash, and uh, and then be ready in time for uh, uh, for, for duchanan in, in good time. And then he says, some places they have a minute that the chazan actually waits at Ritze for the koyanim to come to the bimah which I find very, very strange that, that you have the tziba waiting. I find that very strange. At any rate, but this, I, 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 I saw that in that luach and they give a reference to this. And I've never, I've never heard of this anywhere else that by the words, Hoshev Koyanim Lavidosim Malvim Shiro Zimrom, that's the cue for when the Koyanim go to wash their hands. Um, okay. I just wanted to share this. So this is a, a minig, which apparently was a standard minig back in, uh, that luach was published in Vilna Tofes Tamarvo. It has times for Shabbos, etc., for Odessa, Kharkov, uh, Warsaw, and is it perhaps possibly Vilna. Um, right, let's move on. Right, Here again, I find an, an interesting um, thing which I wasn't aware of, and that is. I had a call was it last night, two nights ago, whatever. Um, a woman, unfortunately, lost her sister living somewhere in the provinces, and they don't have a minion. But in any case, there was no need for a minion for, for the Shiva house if there's no male uh, available to say Kaddish, etc. But uh, people came to the house, and the question was, was do you not say Tachnun? Because of a base of oval, has that got to do with a minion in base of oval, or is it just the base of oval? And you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm more used to the concept of base of oval with a minion there. So, but I actually found this in the Piskei Chuvas, and he says clearly that even if the oval Rahman Litzlan is a woman or a child, so they're not part of the minion, and still that would be reason not to say Tachnu. Uh, he takes this from his sources from this lower quote from the Sefer called Shulchan Shloima, which is an interesting kind of Kitzah Shulchan Aruch, but it's an, well, kind of he's, he's, he's summarized each simon, not like the Kitzah Shulchan Aruch and made his own simon. And he's going numbers on the Mechaber. Anyway, he says clearly, Now, just to explain this, what's the reason for not saying Tachnun the Beisar Ovel? The it's apparently similar to the idea of not saying um tachnun at mairiv, which has got to do with the union of dinim, where there's a time of gavura, you don't want to compound gavura with gavura, dinim with dinim. Night is a time for dinim of gavura, so we don't say tachnun at mairiv. Similarly, base of the similar idea of tishabal is a time of dinim of gavura, and therefore we don't want to say tachnun not to compound gavura with gavura. And um, so that it, it makes perfect sense. But it was for me, it was a chiddush. So uh, I'd like to share, you know, a happier chiddush, but still, it's an interesting thing. Okay, let's go on to the next, um, the next question. And if I minute, if I finish a little bit early, I might be able to get in time for my event at nine thirty. Um, right. So 
and you'll forgive me, I'm sure. Now, here was a story that Atabris, the father whispered to the Moyo, who said the Baruchas, he whispered a, a name, and the Moyo misunderstood the name, and he said a different name. And possibly later he even gives him a written certificate that you have a Moyo, this was the name, and the Korosh baby saw such and such. And the father says, no, that's not the name which I wanted. So now, what happens now? What happens with the um, with the name, which was named in error? Is the child stuck with a Moyle's mistake, or is it corrigible? Okay, so here we have, again, from, I mentioned before, Sefer Psochim uh, He writes that when there was a mistake, and they gave a different name to what the father had instructed. No, no worries. Your father has the rights to change and if you want to us to make it better and do a mishabeirach at a later stage you know shortly afterwards the korish may be israel and you give the name which you want to you, 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 so you do a, 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 like you do a naming of a daughter you come in a, do a name of a boy of korish may be israel and give the desired name that's the he and he gives some sources for that so it's not such a big deal um right now i published these uh you know this list of questions uh, you, you, if you get it up by email, you could have got it in the morning. So um, I got an email from someone in Europe, but he says his Zayda, you may, um, if you learned in Brunois, you may remember someone called Rebleib Edelman. Although he lived in Aubervilliers, he would often come to visit. And he had a son. His name, Rebleib Edelman, his name was Arya Doiv. He had a baby boy. And he gave him a name after the Rebbe Rashab. This is going back to about 85 years ago. So he gave, he gave the name, Shalom Doiv Bear. Then I said, well, hang on a second. Your name is Arya Doiv. What are you giving your name, Shalom Doiv Bear? He was, he was known every, to everyone as Label, but he did have a name Doiv. So the, uh, the name was dropped. And, and this is Reb Shalom Edelman, who was a shliach, a rov in Casablanca. On Shlichus, he was there for some 60 years, and uh, he was originally named Yechon Doiv Bear, but then the name Doiv Bear was dropped because his father, his, his father's name was, was um, Arya Doiv. Just since I mentioned him, I want to mention something fascinating. He passed away, unfortunately, at the beginning of COVID and was buried temporarily in, uh, in Casablanca, and a year or so later, um, many of those who were buried during COVID were brought to burial in Eretz Israel. All the other coffins were relatively light. His coffin was normal weight of just, and, and, and they saw the, that he was, his body was intact after a year of being in, uh, in, in a cave or somewhere in Casablanca and uh, was Aihi Lepele. Okay, someone asked me, um, how do you? How does a person have such a close? I said, listen, Baron is good since sixty years in Casablanca, so uh, he has that close. Okay, let's uh, read. What someone put here on the on the chat. Um, Reb Shaw Cohen is writing. He's seen this minig of going up to the Duchan on those words of Bahosh of Cohen Lavidosum, with a slight variation that the Cohen will have washed their hands before. Especially if there's a lot of kernim, yes, that's what, that's you know, certainly true. If there's a lot of kernim, to start m moving to getting being washed, uh, um, only then is, is going to be a bit of a tircha de, de tibura. Right, thank you. So you you, ha you have seen this minute, okay? Also, kernim have been saying the kernim. Kernim, your your business. Okay. A simple question. Someone asked about does Neta Ravoi apply in Chutzla Oritz? We all know that Orla, the first three years of a fruit tree, which the fruit is forbidden to us, uh, that applies in Chutzla Oritz also, but Sophic Orla, but Chutzla Oritz is Muta. So there's a variation as far as Orla goes between Orla and Neta Sron Oritz and Chutzla Oritz. What about Neta Ravoi, where the fourth year, one would read, like Master Shani, one would either take the actual produce to your shalayim or exchange it for coins and take those coins to your shalayim. So, does that apply if you have a 
a, a fruit tree and you have the fourth year fruit, do you have to be poide that fruit? So this is written clearly in Shulchan Aruch, clearly as in three opinions in Shulchan Aruch. Um, so let's read that inside. Din netra voi, first opinion, noyeg af b'chutz So the first opinion says it does apply in chutz l'aretz. V'yesh mi sh'oymer she'ein noyeg elo b'oretz. The second opinion, it says it only applies in Eretz Yisrael. I will chutz l'aretz peris aboyim acha she'oresh ne'or, and we're talking below pidgin. Second opinion says it doesn't apply in chutz l'aretz. Then there's a third opinion. V'yesh oymer she'ein noyeg be'e chutz l'aretz rak be'kerem, below be'sha'ilons. Now, there's a variation in this between um, between um, vine and other fruit. Other fruit, there's no um, neterevo in chutzlords, and for grapes, it does apply in chutzlords. Lepoyol, the shach, uh, I believe, on the, on the notes on this, lepoyol, one should be poide for a coin and the um, gang right. Right, without a brach. With pigeon of letter of I would be without a broch. Okay, so now the next question which I have on the list, second last, is about the Tzil Shadaim. And we have a difference in the Tzil Shadaim in the morning. We first dry our hands and then we say the broch on the Tzil Shadaim. When we wash for bread, we first, um, we first wash, say the bracha. And then we dry our hands. So what's the difference? Why here? Why, why is there this difference? So part of it is that the drying of the hands when you eat bread is part of the mitzvah. You want to make the bracha before the act of the mitzvah. As a postage, if you eat the bread with your wet hands is as if you've eaten tome bread. And it's because it's a bit of a crass type of behavior to bread is dr a dry kind of food. To eat, hold the bread with your wet hands is it's, it's not a nice thing to do. And because of this, um, the drying of the hands is seen as part of the shlemus of the mitzvah of the Tzitz Shaddaim. So if you can't make the bracha before washing your hands because you may have touched you know, etc. At least you say the bracha before you're drying your hands, so you've fulfilled the idea of over lasiyos the bracha before uh, the mitzvah, the completion of the mitzvah. Um, with the washing the hands in the morning, it's to get rid of ruach ro. It's got to do with um, like a koyan asking that is doing the avoda. There's no emphasis that you have to dry your hands. It's not part of any mitzvah. The drying of the hands in the morning is practical, but it's not part of the mitzvah. And therefore, there's no point in saying the bracha before drying the hands. And possibly or the other way around, that the, um, the, you've gotten, you washed your hands to get rid of ruach ra. Well, perhaps wipe your hands totally and get rid of the ruach ra totally and then say your bracha. That could also be. But this you have here from the Kuti Diburim, it's from Pesach Tovshin Gimel, and the Frederick Rebbe relates three differences between the Tzitz Yadayim in the morning and Tzitz Yadayim at the meal. Um, so as he says here, that by Tzitz Yadayim in the morning, the hands are dry, whereas in Tzitz Yadayim for the meal, the, um, you say the bracha whilst you're rubbing your hands together and before drying the hands. The other thing about the position, in the morning you'd hold the hands a level to the payas arosh, and by, by Ntis Yudayim, for a meal, the hands are held up, Kedeget Halev. And then he has, by the morning, you have your hands apart. And by your by Ntis Yudayim, for a meal, you have your hands close to one another. But meanwhile, we're just dealing with this. Now, here's a very interesting, um, I'm going to go back to the previous slide. Um, very, very interesting. There's a sefer called Ben Ishchai. You all, or everyone knows the name Ben Ishchai. He also has a similar sefer called Oid Yosef Chai, one of his, it looks like his shiurim in halacha, and he quotes from a sefer Pischei Oilam. Pischei Oilam was written by Rebel Karasik, who lived about 100 years ago, what, 100 something, 120 years ago. He's quoted in the Mishnabura, by the way. Uh, perhaps I mentioned this. But what's interesting is, he writes, the Pischei Oilam says in the name of Seder Hayoim. It was a mistake uh, of the Ben Ishchai, made a mistake, 
the Pisgah Yolim says Samach Hay, and he actually means Seder Harav, not Seder Hayom, different difference for him, yeah? Seder Hayom was written by someone, um, um, Chaviv, about 400 years ago, and the Pisgah Yolim, who was a Chabad Chosid, he actually was quoting the Alter Rebbe's Loshen, where the Alter Rebbe writes in the dinim of washing hands in the morning, that be careful about touching the keli. Um, now, then he goes to the whole discussion about this and the suggestion here, um, having a keli which has got a wide mouth and having five or six handles that you shouldn't come to touch one, one hand and touch the other. And he says, all of this is mehamtsois koshois hein. It's hard to come by invention. And even mute sibor and yochayin loud it's, it's something which is beyond most people to be able to do that. Rabbi Hilal is reputed to have had a kvort, which had three handles. Um, what, what, what I want to share with you is the following: We all know minik chabad is to have to use a towel for uh in the suda. Typical a towel over your shoulders, and that is so that you shouldn't touch with your unwashed hand, you shouldn't touch touch the washed hand or the unwashed hand shouldn't touch water on the cup, which is uh, Tommy, and therefore it would dis it, it disqualify it, etc. Is it in, is the same minhag of using uh, using a towel? Does that apply to Nutisu Daim in the morning? Now, practically, to sit by your, to lean over your bed and to wash Negelwasser with a towel, um, I think it's very awkward. And I don't think uh, that's widespread, but people then wash a second time. Is it important to wash Nitzhah uh, Shadayim with a towel in the morning when you, you know, for, this, for the second Negelwasser? That's not documented in, in Sifri Rabbi Sein and Siena. Now, I want to share another thing. Some people have a minig of washing in the morning, Negelvasa, to wash four times. Just like in the Tirs Uda, the first wash is to get rid of the Tumas Yadayim. The second wash is to get rid of the Tumas Hayim of the Tomei water. So they say the first three washes in the morning is to get rid of the Ruch Tuma. And you have to wash a fourth time to get rid of the, the Mayim Tumei. So there is a minig hagro of washing in the morning, washing four times. There is a letter of the Rebbe where he says that well, there's a letter of the Friedrich Rebbe so talks about washing three times. And someone asks, what's the Chiddush? Washing them with three times in the morning. And the Rebbe says, he wants to preclude that you don't have to wash four times, which is the Minika Gro and the Munkacha. So, um, so the Rebbe takes the position that you don't wash four times in the morning. You only wash three times. Although someone tells me that I heard from Rabbi Moshe Lazar, who heard from, um, from Rabbi Jacobson, who says he was once with the Fredekar Rebbe and saw him washing in the morning, he washed four times. But the Herod the Rabbi say he washed Negovasa in the morning three times. And this whole business of this Maim Rishonim and Maim Shniim is a din of Natir Shedaim L'Suda. It was never said by Natir Shadayim Babaika. There is two different types of Natir Shadayim. Here it's Natir Shadayim is my is a technical tumor. The one in the morning has got to do with the Ruach tumor, different things. And we don't find the idea of Maim Rishonim or Shniim for the a priest from the Alter Rebbe, etc. We don't find the idea of Maim Rishonim or Shniim by Negelvas in the morning. And therefore, I don't see the need for um, um, a towel, etc. And uh, Alter Rebbe says, what happens if you're short of water in the morning? So he says, wash once. Ki ikir hatuma, the main tumor go, of, the, of the Ruach hatuma, the main thing goes off with the one, one pouring. So really, even with the, you've once pour, poured once in your Negevas in the morning, you've already gotten rid of the, the main Ruach hatuma. Um, so at any rate, that's, that's as much as I want to share now. If someone wants it in writing, I can share with them what I've written about this. But I don't see the... Uh, the and 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 the uh, and you see the Ben Shai here also saying that you know to take it easy not to require such uh, you know such extreme care 
in a Tiyasudayim in the morning as you would for in Tiyasudayim in the Siddur. Okay, let's go on. The last thing which I have on the list for today is that last week we were talking about buying, uh, whether you'd be allowed to buy a church which was up for sale. And so someone, one of our listeners, sent a, a message that he had just heard another Shia after that, where they said that you should not be buying a distributed ch- church because they're going to take the money and plow it back into proselytizing and evangelism, etc. And that's certainly something which we don't want to sponsor. So here's it becomes into, into his question. Uh, there is a, a premises available. Um, what do you want to get, get for free? Um, and a lot, what happens if if a uh, if a monastery is selling um, liquor? Are you allowed to buy it? You go say, oh well, they're going to take the liquor and they're going to get the, they're selling the liquor. They take the money and they're going to support uh, evangel- evangelical activities. It may be true. Um, so I was I was bothered by this. And here you have from Shukhanoch Yadeh Simul Kuf Mem Gimel, and it says here about a a if the uh, Abed Zora owns a garden, etc., um, about buying from them the fruit, etc. And here there are more the following. That which it says, if the prophets go to the priests, you shouldn't buy it. It's only if it's in the mamish in the garden of the Abed Zora. If it's not there, then he says, if it's going to go for the priests, it's okay to buy it from them. If the money is going to go mamash for the Vedazora, then you shouldn't. On this, the Shah says the following. If, um, it says like this, if the, if the priests would only get the money because you're buying it, then you shouldn't buy it. But if, if you would not have bought um, the, the fruit, then there would be other customers. There would be going who would buy it. They would buy it. They would, they would, in other words, they would make get their money anyway. Then you are allowed to. What he's basically saying is, there's an asset up for sale. If you won't buy it, someone else will buy it. So don't say that you are instrumental in promoting the cause of the Abed Azara. It would have happened in any case. It happens to be that, that, um, um, that you're buying it. But really, they would have gotten their money's worth um, Anyway, so therefore it's you know, it's not your worry. That's why it seems to see. I mean, um, that's as much as I could find on that. And uh, all right, I'm going to stop here and perhaps manage to get in time for Myriv and wish you, meanwhile, all Agbat and Shabbos and Besunas uh, Tavis, Tomid Kolayon. Shabbos. Good job,